Hi, and welcome to the Happiness Coach Podcast. My name is Lori Brandt, and I am the Happiness Coach. I believe our natural state is peace and calm. And the only thing keeping us from living life from that centered space are our limiting beliefs. It's my understanding that thoughts like, I'm not worthy, I'm not safe, or I'm not enough can be eliminated. Once revealed and questioned, they begin to lose their hold so that our natural state of greatness can rise up and into our present day experience. On this podcast, you'll listen in on real life coaching calls, interviews with leading experts, and open discussions exploring limiting beliefs and their transformation. If after listening, you found it interesting or helpful, please follow and share. If it inspired you to consider becoming a life coach yourself, visit my website for upcoming ICF approved life coach certification training dates at www.lauriebrandt.com. All right, let's jump in and get started. I'm really excited today to have Gina Hatzis. She considers herself a recovering journalist uh, because she spent 25 years as an international corporate and public speaker specializing in soulful leadership, stellar communication, and epic empowerment. She's also a blogger, a writer, a spoken word artist, and the host of her show, Spiritual G-Spot, which broadcasts in over 70 countries worldwide. Gina has two viral videos amassing over 40 million views and is currently on a global tour as the superhead and visionary for the Too Much Women movement, a platform for women to shine fully in their glory. And when she's not speaking, writing, dancing, or singing carpool karaoke, uh, she's mothering her amazing teenagers and desperately trying to convince them that she's still dope. (laughs) Her first book, Celebrating the Too Much Woman, is hot off the press. So if you have an opportunity, it's definitely a great read. And you can also connect with her on social media at Gina Hatzis or at www.ginahatsis.com. So hi, Gina. Hey, Lori, thank you for that awesome intro. I have to balance that by saying I'm also a girl here in my sweats and ponytail, <laughs> sitting cross-legged. Um, yeah, being really, really human, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Thanks oh, I, it's such a pleasure. Now, we had met last year, and it's so interesting that that divinely orchestrated meeting, a meeting, I think, because I was looking for a keynote for my conference, and I had a friend sitting in my living room, and she had just, uh, just recently returned from this speaking competition, and that is actually where I think your first video went viral. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Crazy. And it was, um, it was about the um, too much woman. So what, what exactly do you mean by that? Mm. Well, thank you for asking. That is, that has been the story of the past 18 <laughs> months of my life has been uh, really unpacking that. I, I thought I was very clear about, about what it meant and, um, I've really been on a journey exploring what it means and and why it has resonated the way that it has. I guess the best way to explain what it is is to start in the space by explaining that, you know, in in my work as a as a speaker uh, for 25 years, you know, there's this, been this widely accepted narrative, particularly for women, which has us steeped in a deficit of not enoughness. That's all I heard all the time. You know, I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough. I'm not young, old, savvy, pretty, thin, sophisticated, confident enough. So all of these incredibly brilliant women who just feel insufficient. So that was the story that I heard. And what I came to discover is that there's a parallel and opposing storyline that's not being discussed. And it's just as destructive and just as successful in keeping a woman small. And it's the untold story of the too much woman, which has been the story of my life. You know, a woman who is 
been called too intense, too sensitive, too emotional, too passionate, too driven, too smart, too sensual, too needy, too ambitious. I mean, go, the list goes on too dramatic, too honest, too pretty, too wild, too successful, too intimidating. I mean, it just doesn't stop. So the too much woman is one who is, is forced in some way uh, to cram the bigness, the truth of who she is into this tight box of predictability, um, stability, you know, she, she's got to be kept in check. And so as women, um, we're kind of like on lockdown, you know, we're, we're accused of being, and, and, you know, this is, I don't know if this is just women. I'm sure that it's men. I hear from men all the time, but the too much woman is the woman who, as she is, has received a message that she is wrong. And so in some way we are dimming ourselves in order to be accepted, loved, um, appreciate it, to feel safe. So that's, that's who the too much woman is. That's who I was. And I, I actually didn't think anyone would understand the too much woman. Um, when I wrote this speech and shared this speech at this speaking competition that your friend went to, I, I believed I was taking a huge risk sharing a story. I didn't think anyone would understand because I'd only heard the not enough story. And so I said to myself, you know, after 25 years speaking and writing and crafting talks that were focused on the audience, it was the very first time I was sharing a story that was just about me. And it wasn't intended to, you know, <laughs> go viral or to, for anything. It was really just me being, for once, being honest about my journey. And, um, and yeah, the rest is history. I, I, I guess uh, it's been a journey that is for so That so incredible to hear uh, you feeling empowered and and allowing yourself to be vulnerable enough to do that speech because uh, and yet that is exactly what I love about speakers is when they share that deepest intimate moment and let us in and see who you are and I know your writings very much do that and I know that when I watched the video, it was like, yes, yes, I want her. <laughs> so I think you said 40 million views. So what what is that like mm -hmm. to have some 40 million people resonate with your message enough to watch that? This happened 18 months ago. And when I, I, I quite honestly, it's it, there's nothing heroic in me being vulnerable enough to share my story. It, it actually was, um, I wrote a completely different speech for this event. Um, something that was funny, something I thought people would, would get a kick out of. Um, but a couple of days before the actual speaking competition, I was sitting on my bed and I received, I, I can only describe <laughs> it as a hot flash. I don't know what else to compare it to, but it was almost like this, this thing washed over me, this knowing washed over me that I had something else that was, that was so important that I, I wanted to tell. And quite frankly, I thought the speaking competition was going to be 30 people at a bar. I, I had no idea that it was, um, you know, a couple hundred people that winning the competition would have it go on social media, that it would be picked up and go viral. I mean, you have to understand it. It was a very innocent sharing. It, you know, it wasn't brave. It wasn't me thinking, oh, I'm going to, you know, change the world and, and tell my truth, speak my truth. So I, I really want to make it clear that there was nothing, uh, so there's nothing heroic about that. Um, but what's, what is it like? <laughs> I'm still digesting it, Lori. I don't know what 40, 40 million means. I don't, you know, my city is like a couple million. I'm trying to like, I don't know, except what I do know is that this isn't my story any longer. Um, this is a story that that is, um, you know, I'm the vessel speaking on behalf of so many people who feel like they have, they're not showing up fully as themselves. And it sounds so cliche, but um, I, I really feel like it has been an opportunity for me to, to invite people into a place where I can say, it's okay to show up in all the ways that you've been told is wrong. And uh, I'm still digesting. I don't know what 40 million, I can't even wrap my head around a hundred <laughs> people. I, quite honestly, it's such a personal so story you say for me. You're not but... Brooke, but I absolutely disagree because in, you know, when I'm working with people and they, they allow themselves to open up to just a little bit, just a little bit to consider that what they've been told mm -hmm 
is not the truth to open up just a bit to consider that maybe there's mm -hmm. another perception here that maybe I am perfect just the way I am that I can show up and be me mm. just as I am and regardless of what other people think and to me that that takes a hero a hero in your own life to be able to step up and entertain that and I think you know your your video what it does is it's like hey if she can do that I can do that too in my own life and and that's what I love about it mm. Thank you. I, I will, I will own that what this experience has gifted me with is the opportunity to, if anything, be a model of possibility for people. And I, I don't take that lightly. It hasn't been <laughs> like fun all the time. Um, you know, the level of visibility that I'm experiencing now uh, is very exciting. You know, it, it's, it's like everybody wants to it seems like everyone, you know, it, this seems like a, the, the epitome of you know, success, you know, like have all these likes and have all these people love you and to tour the world. And, and it is wonderful. I'm very grateful. And um, it, it comes with a lot of, I mean, it's just like anything, you know, you put a magnifying glass on anything and um, all the good and all the challenge is uh, exacerbated it's magnified and so that has been my experience the past 18 months so i i feel emboldened by um the community of people that have shown up for me um, by people who say i needed to hear this um, by people who say you know i'm finally ready to embrace my too muchness that's that's how i can become more hero heroic so it's not something i think that is birthed within me i get so much support and so much encouragement from people who say, because I see you doing it, um, maybe I can do it too. So, and, and just on that note, I'd yeah. love to like take a magnifying glass and zero in on, mm. you know, okay, so here's this younger Gina and she's constantly in this perpetual state of trying to be what everybody wants, you know, don't do this and don't be too much that and don't be too much this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, was there a time when you recall opening up to like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute, I'm going to, I'm going to be this or well, like, wait a minute. Is that, is, um, is there another way of looking at this that maybe I'm not too much? Maybe I'm oh, gosh. just the right amount. Oh gosh, no, no, there was nothing spectacular like that. My story isn't that, that, um, seamless at all, Lori. I, it took me to 40 I'd say my late thirties when I started to get an inkling that this wasn't working, this way of being wasn't working um, because of the work that I do, because it's, it's, there's such a focus on personal growth and development. You know, the teacher teaches what they themselves have to learn. That's, mm -hmm. that's how I, and so, you know, as the quote unquote teacher, or, you know, when I'm in a space where I'm, 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 uh, yeah, you know, where I'm in community with people who want to live their best life. Um, I'm also on the journey. And so mm -hmm. what I was finding was that um, when you're in front of a class or in, on a stage, um, the, the implication is that you have arrived, is that you are an expert in something, that you're, you know, you've landed on the other side of the bridge and that you're looking back, you know, reaching your hand out. And, and while there's an element of truth to that, I think what we're realizing now in today's day and age is that this expert model, this expert paradigm is really crumbling. We see that with politics. We see that within the medical system. We see that in the education system. We see that in so many places that this idea that, you know, there's an expert who's going to tell us how to be um, is, is crumbling. And so where I've transitioned, and to go back to your question, the road that I had to, to travel down is to stop, you know, dancing with this mask that Gina is, has figured it out. Um, this facade that I am perfect, that I know what I'm doing, that it's, you know, that it's all okay. And to really crack myself open to being honest about what I'm struggling with. And um, the reason that that, that that came to be is because I was masquerading as Gina and being loved and having great success as Gina, but not the Gina that I, I truly am. And it started to dawn on me that people who love me weren't really actually loving me because the, the person I was showing up was, as wasn't even myself. And so it started to really scare me that people loved me, but that wasn't even the real me. So was I even 
being loved and cared for and respected at all. And that's when it started to crumble. That's when the facade started to crumble. And I started to say, what would it be like to show up in my too muchness? Like what, what, okay. So people are going to, some people aren't going to get it. Some people are going to reject me. Um, and a lot have, oh my God, (laughs) I have stories. Some people are going to be freaked out. Some people are going to criticize. Some people are going to talk about, you know, all of these things. And is that the life that I would rather live than being loved for what I am not. And that has been the dance that I've been dancing for the past couple of years. So it, it hasn't been like, a, you know, oh, I get it now. I'm going to show up in my too muchness. It's been like, oh God, I can't play act this role anymore. Um, dare I go to the other side? What's the lesser of the evils? Does that answer your oh, question? Oh, yes, no? definitely. Okay. When I'm working with people with limiting beliefs, what I notice is that they're, the limiting beliefs are just beliefs that we believe to be true. So in your case, you were too, you were too big, too bold, too passionate, too sensitive. That was mm-hmm. That was the message. And then somewhere along the line, there's an opening. Uh, that's all I can kind of describe it is. It's when somebody maybe it starts to consider that maybe there's a different way. And it sounds like that's the inkling you're talking about that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, that's that. Okay. So when you say that, what comes up and I feel it's important to share this, I share this Mm -hmm. in the book. So throughout my life now, because, you know, hindsight is 2020, I can Mm -hmm. look back at, at situations where I, I showed up in my too much. So for example, I was a very sensitive, you know, I'll say sensitive child. That was the story that I was told. Gina's Mm -hmm. very sensitive. I cry easily. Um, I would feel things very deeply. Um, I would, you know, people in the classroom, even when I was a kid would be having a hard time. And my heart would just, I would do anything and everything to help them. You know, a new kid would come to the school and I would go out of my way. I just, I was a very empathetic, sensitive child. And what happened was because my family kept lovingly wanting to toughen me up, um, telling me you're too sensitive, stop crying. Um, They would hide things from me, you know, deaths in the family or difficult, difficult situations because they thought I couldn't handle it. Um, I, I, I got the impression that my sensitivity was wrong and that I needed to stop feeling so much. I needed to stop caring so much. I needed to stop, um, you know, shut that part off of me that was so open and vulnerable. And um, when I was 10 years old, I, for about a year, I had a a constant dream of uh, fire in our home. It was the same dream every single night. My parents didn't know what to do with me. They they tried to convince me it was crazy. They took me to see people like they (laughs) they couldn't understand. It was just, it was a year of nonstop nightmares. And, um, we, my mother remarried at that time, we moved into a new home. And of course, the first thing I did was go around and check all the smoke detectors. And one of the smoke detectors, uh, did not work. And I begged them, begged them. I think the battery, maybe it was the battery. I don't know what it was, but I begged them, please, please, please fix this. And they laughed and they poo pooed it. And gosh, you're such a worrier. You, you know, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, Christmas comes and I got some Christmas money and I went and I bought a replacement smoke detector. 17 days later, um, our house uh, went, was on fire in the middle of the night and that smoke detector saved our lives. That, when I look back, I have so many stories like that, but when I look back at um, examples of when I stepped into my too muchness, how it served me, now it makes so much sense to me why I need to embrace it. You know, my too much sensitivity, sensitivity has made me a great a, lo- a lover, a great mother, uh, an, a, a wonderful friend. It helps me do the work that I do. Um, and so I can look back now and see it, but I think at the time I, I, I didn't have the awareness. Is that, is that more helpful? What I love about this is that you, from this place where you are now, you're able to identify the too much woman thoughts that, mm-hmm made you uh, project yourself as someone other than who you really feel you are. And that mm-hmm. showed up in maybe not showing your sensitivities. Is that, is that how it showed up when you were younger? Yeah. So I would, you know, um, I would, especially around my family, you know, I would toughen up. I would, um, 
hide when I felt anything, you know, I'd, I'd go into the, even with my children, you know, when, when tough situations came up, my grandfather passed, um, I would go and hide in the bathroom and cry because I, I, you know, I was, I had this programming that said, you know, don't show them how upset you are. And I, there's a part of me that knew that it wasn't right, but I, I kept catching myself dimming parts of me. Yes. There, there's so many examples. I mean, yeah. to, I mean, I can get, that's just sensitivity, too sensitive. I mean, I have, I got a slew. How much time you got? I mean, I, <laughs> but, I've got but a it's whole a great bunch. example though, to show people like, okay, so we have this belief that we're too sensitive. And right. it, we, we, you know, kind of almost take it on almost through osmosis because everyone's mm-hmm. telling us and we just start, okay, well, I must be too sensitive. Then we start to behave in a way that identifies with that thought, which is I'm going to hide when I, when I feel, you know, feelings. Yep. And, right. and so I'm, I'm curious. So that's the strategy I hide. Does hiding show up in your life still today, even though you're aware of it? Absolutely. Do you mind sharing I, I, some examples? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I, I laugh at it now because I mm-hmm. think, you know, when you're done, you're dead. I, I don't, I'm not interested in the finish line. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, my goal in life, my highest priority is to evolve and grow. And so I believe that the spiritual journey is cyclical. You know, things keep showing up for me and where I used to say, Gina, you should be over this by now. You teach this stuff. <laughs> I mean, get with the program. Um, it's like a record skipping. But what I what I see now is that it shows up in different ways, right? It, it shows, So for example, um, right now, my too much sensitivity shows up you know, with this huge level of visibility, you know, I'm, I'm, I still post, I still speak, um, you know, and, and it's not always, and as I go deeper into this work and I'm choosing to be more courageous about sharing other parts of me, um, there is a lot of criticism. Um, there are a lot of people who have decided to, um, exit stage right in my life. Um, people who think I'm oversharing and that I'm, I'm caring too much that I'm, um, you know, whatever. And I can see the pattern of me, um, being really careful about what I share sometimes or over explaining why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, it's like, I'm desperate to be understood. I'm desperate to apologize and make it right. And I catch myself in that space. And I say, you know, my, too much sensitivity, my connection to this part of me is what the too much woman story is. It is what draws people in. It is being a model of possibility. And that's the life I want to choose. And so I do catch myself all the time dimming and hiding. Because what's so interesting, and I think people don't realize that limiting beliefs are, like you said, it just keeps coming up. There's no kind of end point. But it does get easier and better where, yes, they might still be in your life, but you're able to become aware of them and maybe not take on the behavior that you used to. And that is it. That is just so amazing because you're basically transforming how that belief is showing up. So I'm just curious, you know, you talk about two things. You talk about how they're showing up. So the hiding still wanting to come up and to not be Mm -hmm. too sensitive. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? And then maybe if you could just give an example of how it, it doesn't come to fruition, let's say into your life, the hiding piece. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the pieces that is really present for me right now, if we could switch out of too sensitive is, um, you know, on this, this, this spiritual, really deep dark night of the soul that I, that began about four years ago for me. And I believe that it's all divine timing like that. It, that happened so that I could, I could tell the too much woman story so that I could have this opportunity now to, to speak to so many people. Um, what happened on that journey is I, as a 40 year old mother of two, um, deep in my spiritual practice came across, um, uh, my too much sensuality, a connection to a part of me that, that I had, shut off and dimmed uh, for many reasons over my lifetime. Um, As a child, um, having been uh, very afraid of my body, afraid of the attention from men, afraid of uh, many, many things about exposing myself, I spent a lifetime dimming my, my sensuality. Let's, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. 
And when 40 came around and I went into a deep spiritual practice, it's funny because someone had said to me, you know, anybody who's on a sincere spiritual quest at some point will come up across their, their, their sensuality, their sexuality, because that's, that's the essence. It's who we are. And I resisted it, resisted it. You know, I felt like I dealt with every part of myself, but that I thought that was like the furthest thing from a spiritual quest. And when it would no longer be, um, suffocated or suppressed it came up in full force in mm-hmm. in my early 40s and what i what was so curious to me was here i was showing up um as a, as much as a man as i could especially in in my profession as a speaker as a corporate speaker as well you know i would man up i would dress like a man i would act like a man i'd, I'd really tap into my masculine energy to be a successful entrepreneur to be seen as serious as smart as a contributing member um and um what i as i shifted as i started to embrace and started to really shift my awareness around this and really allow myself to fully accept that I am a a sensual being to actually let my hair down literally and figuratively (laughs) to actually allow myself to feel those feelings and to be seen in that way. Um, It was scary as heck, Lori. Like talk about talk about hitting our limiting beliefs. It was like, oh, so now you want to show up as a woman bearing skin. Now you want to show up as a woman with desire. Now you want to show up as a woman who admits that she is a sensual being and you want to also be seen as a professional and be taken seriously and be a mother. Okay. I want to zero in. I want to imagine you standing in front of the mirror, getting ready for that first time that you decide to let your hair down. What was what was the conversation you're having with yourself? Well, the, what, what precipitated it, and I talk about this in my speech, was I, one of the biggest talks of my life, the very first one, was 300 men in an audience, like white men in suits. And it was a, it was, I was the only female speaker, uh, 12 men, and it was a huge conference. And it was it, the, the, the stakes were really high. And I manned up for that. Like I wore a black suit, like buttoned to the top. I put my hair in a bun. I even bought fake glasses. I don't wear glasses. I bought <laughs> fake glasses to look smarter to look to de defeminize you know whatever i to hide and to hide yeah. i didn't wear heels i wore these flat boots i just wanted to not look like a woman and mm-hmm. i killed that talk i i know that it was so good that i had a standing ovation i flew off the stage thinking i've i've i landed i arrived like i've proved myself and i remember going out to the parking lot and feeling like i was floating i was just so pr- damn proud of myself and i get out to the parking lot and a, a gentleman from the audience comes up to me and he he grabs my arm and he he whispers to me you know i have a fetish for librarian types and and I, in that moment, I realized that here I was thinking I was winning, not being me. And I, I wasn't even winning even then. Mm. And that, that shifted the track for me. Cause I thought I can't even f- win at faking, you know, <laughs> dimming that part of me. So when you say the next time I was in the mirror, I don't know that it was a, a, a switch that flipped that I was like, okay, that's it. I'm going to let it all hang out and I'm going to, but I, I, it started to dawn on me that I can't like, you're going to lose it's like the, a rock in a hard place. You know, you're, I'm going to lose either way. I mean, lose in quotations. It's not going to be what I want. So I may as well be as honest to myself and be seen as myself and let the cards fall where they may. Okay. And it was a slow process of doing that. Yeah. And I think that that's so great that you shared that. Can you recall what maybe were the first couple steps of that process? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the first couple steps of that process were, um, I, I actually went on a, um, to New York city. I started reading a lot about, about in this particular case about being connected to my sensuality as a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Like it was the most foreign thing in, in the world to me because I grew up in the Catholic church. Like I, I, it just was the most foreign thing. So I, my background is journalism. And so I was like, well, let me, I just got to understand this intellectually. So I started reading <laughs> books. I went to New York City. I went to a visit this woman named Mama Gina who put on the, who talks all about this. I started just to read and research feverishly. What does it mean to, to be, to honor these feelings that I have about myself? And it's not about having sex at all. I, I don't want to, I want to be very clear. It's really about saying as a sensual being, I do not have to pretend that I'm 
that I am not who I am. You know, I, I love to wear dresses and be flirty and have, you know, my hair is now pink. I, you know, I, <laughs> I, 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 I just, I, I love to be in my feminine energy. It feels powerful to me and I don't want to feel ashamed about it. So it started as a very intellectual process for me. Okay. That's how my mind works. It's like, let me research, you know, what is legitimate about these feelings that I have? Is it legit, legitimate? And then from there, I started to implement little practices. I started to allow myself to feel sensual. And the, my process specifically um, was um, dancing. You know, I was a dancer growing up and I cut that out of my life because I thought, you know, a 40 year old mother of two who's a professional does not dance the way I wanted to dance. Like I <laughs> dancing and salsa dancing. I used to belly dance and I was like, I'm, I'm 40 something. Like this is, and I, I started to question that limiting belief. I said, why can't a woman in her forties who is a mother, who is, you know, who's a professional, who's, why can't she move her body that way? So I started just taking classes and I, I I remember being so emotional, that very first belly dancing class, like I bawled the whole class because I, I, I was, feelings were coming up that I, I didn't ever allow myself to feel, um, being connected to my body in that way, letting it move in a way that I had shut down for so long. And in shutting down those feelings about being connected to my body and feeling like a sexual being, you know, I was married. I, I just shut all of that down. I didn't think I was allowed to feel that way. And, and allowing that to come up just opened up all these other possibilities that is for me. so beautiful my passion is to just explore that piece that you just talked mm -hmm. about because those feelings that came up in belly dancing to me that represents you coming home to to the true essence of who you are and it's so important for all of us to reconnect with our bodies because our bodies really are the first line of letting us know that we're disconnecting from that or that we're coming back to it and so it can be like that lighthouse in our lives where it's like, oh, I get to feel like this. This is how we're supposed to live. That's so, so beautiful. And, you know, Laura, I thank you for that and, and seeing me in that way. I, I will tell you that it, it, it allowed me also, let's go back to the too, too sensitive or too emotional. or It allowed me also to access feelings that I never let myself fully feel, which has been a huge breakthrough for me. So because I had been told I was too emotional, too sensitive, too dramatic growing up, I put a lid on how far I let my feelings mm. go. So I'd get emotional or I'd get upset about something and I'd cry like delicately. Mm. You know, I'd be like, sniff, sniff, a couple tears. I would never let myself feel the full expression of my grief, you know, whether it was with death, whether it was separation, whether it was just sadness, disappointment. It was always like a delicate tiptoeing around my feelings and just starting to feel into my body. What I started to allow myself to do was to go there. I, I had this perception that if I let myself feel mm. so sad, so disappointed that I would never, it would never stop, that I wouldn't be able to come that back. That is not like, uncommon. A lot of people have uh, that experience. Yes, definitely. Right. Right. And so I learned slowly in the process to let myself go there. So it started off in the bath uh, and the shower so that it started off like, okay, I'll go into the bath and I'll just let myself cry. You know, I'll run the water or I'll make sure nobody's home and just, just let myself cry and see what happens. And then it became, I didn't want to cry at some, sometimes I was angry and I, I, I allowed myself to take like create space where I could feel really angry. And I know it, maybe it sounds crazy, but I would actually, you know, I dropped the kids off at school. No one was home. I had a couple of hours and I had this grief in me that needed to, that wanted to be expressed. And I was scared to let it bubble up that I wouldn't be able to come back from the depths. But I, I started to allow myself in pieces to do that. So I created a playlist. This is God honest truth um, with the music that, um, let me go there. So I have like a sad playlist, and I have, <laughs> you know, like, and I actually have a rage playlist. Like it's like Alanis Morissette and like, like just, and it was, it's uh, songs that allow me to just rage. And I darken the room. I pull the shades down. I, I put, I let my hair go wild and I, I pound pillows. I do whatever. I mean, it took me a, a, a while to get there, but it, it was such an important cathartic 
part of me physically. I want to go back to the physicality yeah. of physically allowing the limiting belief to move through me. It wasn't an intellectual process anymore. It was like, okay, now I've read the books. I understand intellectually how to you know, talk myself out of a li- limiting belief, but I had to embody it. Yes. And so belly dance was one way, like let this, let my sexuality bubble up and let me feel like a sexy unleashed God. Like I, oh my gosh. And it made me cry because I was like, I, it feels good to feel good. <laughs> like, oh my God, you know, it's like, oh my God. It's, it's like, it's, it was like, it was orga- like, I don't, I don't want to make fun of it. It was like orgasmic to the degree that I was like, I can't believe I can allow my body to feel good and it's okay. And even with the rage, like, I can't believe I can allow this rage to move through me and it's not going to kill me. And and that was, those were breakthroughs for me. I think yeah. that when you were talking about the, uh, the, the, the getting angry or whatever, I did that too. Yeah. I literally, yeah, <laughs> I got a bat and I stacked some pillows on a bed and I yeah. just <laughs> wheeled that bat for as long as it took. And honestly, I could almost feel different parts of my insides coming up yes. and, and letting go. Like it was like, oh my gosh. And then the energy that got freed up from that was just unbelievable. And I, I think I, I've, I've really, I've talked to my girlfriends about this. I think there should be like raging studios, just like there's, <laughs> yeah. just like there's, you know, dance studios and all, like yoga studios. Like it's, it, the, there's, there needs to be a, a place for this and it needs to be okay. And it needs to be acceptable. It needs to be talked about. I mean, your friend comes to you and she's crying and what do we instinctively do? Or your child, we instinctively say, oh, there, there, don't cry. It's going to be okay because we're uncomfortable and we don't often get the message that that what you're feeling needs to be expressed I had chronic sore throats my entire life like non-stop throat infections and it wasn't until I started to express my my rage my 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 truth my sadness my everything um, that that it stopped and I it's no coincidence to me I know this to be true it's no coincidence to me that my body was holding on to the emotion in my throat. It was holding on to my truth in my throat. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can talk about this until the <laughs> because I just, I feel it so passionately. You know, so passionate. We had this question at the, at the last uh, Unleash Your Greatness conference. Someone said, well, you know, it, it, you know, you're talking about transforming the beliefs so that you can transform the feelings, but what about allowing the feelings? And I think it's, I think for even this conversation that we're having is we're not saying it's not okay to feel the way that you feel. You want to transform the limiting beliefs so that those feelings are not what gets felt. If you are living without them, you're connected to that belly dancing feel. You're connected to that deep release and joy that you get when you let go of all that. Today, when they come up and those feelings come up, are they coming up the same way or is it a different experience? Mm, that's a good question. I want to say that the markers are the same. The flags are the same. Um, I still want to be loved and accepted by everyone. I mean, I still <laughs> hate when I post something and I get a backlash of criticism or, you know, even as simple as my mother calling me and saying, really, Gina, like that was a really provocative picture. Or I think you went over the line or I think you overshare. Like and it doesn't, whatever it is, I, it still rubs me. And I, 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 the difference now is that, I mean, I still feel it the same way, to be quite honest. The difference now is I can identify it. I see it. I'm aware of it. And in that awareness, I have coping mechanisms now to make a different choice. And this isn't to say that I always do. I mean, I just the other day, I was like, mom, back off. Like, <laughs> back off. I know you love me, but back off. Like, I'm in a different space now. This is important for me to share. But I, I also, more often than not, I can identify it and I can make a different conscious choice. But the only reason that that can happen is because I'm in a place now where I know how to, uh, I want to say process the feeling, but allow for the feelings to surface, Yeah, you know, rather than just be reactive and, and defensive and fight or shut down and, and hide. Now it's like, okay, so this is what I'm feeling. How do I want to 
deal with that. Yeah, because we're talking about, you know, oh, we're just going to release these feelings. But we also have people probably listening there thinking, yeah, if I let that baby out, it's not going to stop. And then and there is that, yes. right? So I just wanted to give voice to how yes. that's not how it always is. Like at first, yes, nope. you know, there, you might be doing the shower cry, you might be doing the the yep. slamming and but 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 that isn't required after a while in our well my experience because what happens is that that you know long forgotten emotional baggage starts to come up and, and gets out mm. so that you recognize how it feels but you're you start to be okay with it coming up I think too I, I, I do I do want to say I think too that what you just said that brought up something so strong for me I don't want to forget is that um, the intensity of those feelings um, came about because I had not addressed them for so long. And so now when I start to get the little red flags, I address them sooner. Yes. You know, yeah. and so it, when you, it's just like anything, you know, you start to accumulate, accumulate, accumulate these, th this resentment or this feeling, and then it bursts like the dam bursts. I think that's one of the reasons it's not as intense anymore is because I don't let it build. I don't let it go 20 years. I don't let it <laughs> fester for so long. You know, I see the, the signs and I go, okay, Gina, we need to, to regroup this. So I think that's a really important so you, reason. you refer to markers or the signs. So what are they for you? Yeah. Cause we all kind of have different ones, but so what are yours? Um, what are mine? So they're very visceral for me. Like they're very somatic. Like I, I, they're a tightness in my stomach, you know, I'm very connected to my intuition. And so, um, you know, start, I talk to so many people on my, because I'm traveling so much lately and, um, I'm, I have so many opportunities brought to me and now the feelings are very visceral. So I'll, you know, I'll have a conversation with someone on the phone and it's either a hell no or a hell yes. I'll just feel a tightness or a contraction. Um, those are signs for me. Whereas before I would override them and say, oh, but this is a great opportunity. Oh, but it would be really good if, oh, but you know, um, you should, you should, um, oh, but you don't want to disappoint people. Now for me, um, the, the signs are, are, I'm so connected to my body in a way that I wasn't before that when the, the, the physical, um, my body intuitively has a response. I'm, I'm much more aware of it and I honor it in a, in a way that I didn't before. Yeah. And that, that's really what are the conference that you, you were a keynote there that we, that was what it was all about is about connecting people with the thoughts they're thinking and how it shows up in the body. So I'm curious. So the whole throat thing now, is there a physical like that you register and like, Oh, what <laughs> it's that again. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it was so funny because for many years, I, I'd say up until about 35, when I really started to connect that, um, Louise Hay was instrumental. Um, her, her work and her book was really pivotal, helping me to connect, you know, what is it about my throat? You know, I think the body very much is a representative of, of, of who we are. So when I, when I connected the fact that I, I always swallowed my truth, I always swallowed what I really wanted to say. I always swallowed um, my emotion and connected that to my throat. As soon as I started to have an awareness around that, I didn't have sore throats. It literally stopped dead in its tracks. However, I will say that because the spiritual journey is cyclical <laughs> and here I am at, you know, last year I was 43, the too much woman goes viral, all this crazy stuff, like my whole life is under a magnifying glass and I'm swallowing truths again, or I'm, I'm you know, they're half truths or I'm not I'm like, okay, well, I'll share this much or I'll, you know, and it started again. And I know like I would wake up and I'd go, oh boy, here she is. Like my throat would be scratchy. And now for me, that's a sign. And I, I, I ask myself, where in my life am I not being honest? Where do I need to speak up? Where do I need to share more? Or where do I need to just, at least, and it doesn't always mean I'm sharing on a large scale. Sometimes it just means having a conversation with someone. Sometimes it just means writing in my journal, like yeah. to be quite frank, yeah. but th th my body's always speaking to me. Your body is always speaking to you. And so um, those are, those are definite signs for me. A lot of people talk about um, they're in the space. They want their lives to be different. They, they, you know, have an awareness. I'm probably believing limiting beliefs, but I don't, you know, the idea of feeling all that old stuff 
to get to the other yeah. side, right? Yeah. So how how did you or what was it like for you to be in that space of this is where I am and this is what I don't want. And I know I want something different. And you might not even know what that right. is, but you just know yeah. what you're doing isn't working. But there's this space of fear. There's this space of challenge. There's the space of the unknown. So how did you do it? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be very honest. It For me, and I think this is true for so many people, it wasn't a heroic choice. Like, I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to choose to be courageous. It, it happened for me because I hit rock bottom. And I think for so many of us, whether it's illness, uh, it's, you know, it's loss, death, divorce, you know, um, it's, it's a wake up call, a wake up call. And that was certainly the case for me. I don't think we have to have that happen to us for us to make different choices. Certainly not. Um, but that's what it was for me. It was kind of like, I can know the pain of living my life this way outweighs the pain of trying a different way. And, and what is so scary about the different way is, you know, it's different. Like the pain that I had felt my whole life dimming, um, although it was uncomfortable, it was predictable. Like I understood it. It was, I was used to it. So I knew what was going to happen, right? Feel this way, um, hide, feel like shit, but it was predictable. I, I, I understood it and it was comfortable for me. Um, deciding to show up in a new way um, was going to require me to be willing to take some risks and move into an unknown space. Like I don't know how people will react. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know how they're going to, they're going to respond. Um, so part of it for me was I had, I felt like I had no choice. I, I hit a part where I just said, I can't do this anymore. I cannot do this anymore. And, uh, you know, again, I've seen, I've worked with so many people who uh, could be a diagnosis where they finally go, Oh my God, I, I've been living this lie the whole time, you know? Um, but, but where I am now and what I talk to people about now is I think it's really important when we we decide or we're curious like for anyone listening who says okay I recognize this limiting belief I don't want to get to the point where you know I'm at my rock bottom and I don't start small start small don't pick the big kahuna limiting belief that you've carried on your back for 40 50 60 years and go there start small um you know start with something that um you can build your confidence around. Start with something where you can see some incremental shifts. Um, okay, so let's say, for example, uh, your the sexuality, embracing your. Yeah, that was a big one. That was a big one. Yeah, okay, so okay, so a baby step. Well, a baby step for me literally was taking a dance class. Like you don't know how many. When I started posting, this is maybe going back two, three years. I started posting that I was going to start dancing again. Um, you don't know how many women are like, I want to, I still want to, I want to, I got to lose the weight first, or I've got to, you know, my kids are too little or not yet, or I, I can't do that. Or so that was, that was a baby step for me. It was like, I'm going to go take a dance class. And it didn't start off with belly dance. Like, let me be clear. It was like, oh, I'll take like, I'll take like an <laughs> exercise. And then it turned into like a, a ballet bar class. And then like, everyone's like, oh, you should take pole dancing. I'm like, that's the furthest thing. Maybe I'll try belly dance. Like I, it was baby steps in that way. And, um, and then the confidence, I, I, I'm telling you, Lori, one class, two, five, I was like seeing other women doing it, being inspired by them. I was like, oh my gosh, maybe I, I, I will do this next thing. So starting with baby steps, I think is, is so important. I think we try to leap into, you know, the, the, the huge ocean instead of just dipping our toe in the pool. Like there's no, there's nothing shameful in that. Yeah. And, and I think that, okay, so let me, I want to go right in there. So <laughs> what happened like before knowing you were like, it was going to be dance? Like, was there any thought process, you know, you know, cause imagine you, you don't want to put yourself out there. You've been told don't put yourself out there right. and you're considering it. Yeah. Well, the way I, what I, for me, the reason it was dance was because I, I had my daughter, my daughter, Isabella, she's now 13, but she was, uh, she's a competitive dancer. And so I would watch her on the stage and all these feelings would come up missing, like just admiring how comfortable she was in her body, um, watching how she could, she could move and, and longing to feel that again. And so the, the, that went on for some time and I started to think, gosh, I really miss dance. Maybe I could just take oh. like a dance class. Maybe so I could just. So you were getting some hits there as oh, to yeah. what to do. So that's really, that's amazing. So if anyone's listening, they might want to consider 
are there some thoughts about some things that maybe you um, might enjoy doing, but are overlooking them? Mm. Yeah. And, and that, what really, part of what precipitated that is when I went on that journey, that in, very intellectual journey to try to understand um, from a spiritual perspective, what that would mean uh, to connect back to my body. Uh, one of the things that I started to follow were the breadcrumbs of pleasure and desire. Like I had cut myself off so much, particularly, I think, as a, as a parent, as a woman, as a professional, as a caregiver, you know, most of us are, um, we're taught to prioritize and to give, give, give. And so I had cut myself off from feeling anything truly for myself. Like I would take the crumbs on Saturday morning and have coffee by myself outside, but that was the extent of it. Like I really didn't explore my pleasure and desire. And when I started to allow myself, not even allow myself, I made it my intention. I said, every morning, I'm going to spend the first minutes of the morning, not meditating, not exercising, not drinking green juice, you know, not doing any (laughs) of the things they tell. I'm going to start off with prioritizing my pleasure. What does Gina want to do this morning? And I started, I started taking, I love to take a bubble, but I started taking baths in the morning and playing music. Like who takes a bath first thing in the morning? Like I started to just get cured. Like, what do I, what do I So feel? that's interesting. Can you, what's the connection between your sexuality, let's mm. say, or maybe there isn't one, but I'm, um, yeah. and the, the bubble bath and, and like asking yourself that and, and following through with the bubble bath. Because the, the connection, the, the connection is pleasure. It's, it's like, if pleasure was my priority. If pleasure, feeling good in my body is my highest priority and I start the day off in that space, what is the, what could potentially happen the rest of the day? You know, a woman who, who prioritizes her pleasure, who imagine me starting off my day. Now for me, it was the bath. Sometimes it was dancing. Um, Imagine me starting off my day in the energy of, I feel so full and alive. I feel so full and alive and appreciative of this body and my energy feels good. And I, I'm turned on like literally and figuratively just turned on with myself. Like I just feel so good. And then I'm going to go out and uh, take a business call or, you know, make my kids lunch or. Now that, you know, what's so great about that? What an amazing baby step. Cause I think you're right. I think a lot of people think, well, you know, I can't be Gina standing on stage and, you know, doing these talks. And it's, it's not about that. It's about finding that one little first step to move out of the habit of what you've been doing about how you have been shutting that part of yourself off and moving towards what it is that you're wanting. It's so amazing. I really invite anyone listening. I, I would have to say that the, the first step, and I talk a lot about this, anybody listening, uh, so many, I, I think that the story on repeat that I hear now, thousands, tens of thousands of people at this point is I don't even know what I want anymore. Mm. I don't even know. Like I, I'm, I'm, I get, I don't even know. I haven't even given myself the opportunity to really ask, like, what do I really want? What do I desire? What, what would feel really good to me? What, like, and so, I would invite you. You know, you remember when? Remember when? When you you fall in love <laughs> with someone for the first time? Like, what do you do? You want to know everything about them? Like, tell me your favorite food, your favorite your favorite movie. Where where would you want to go? Anywhere in the world? Favorite color? Why can't we turn that on? to ourselves and start to get really curious about yourself, like connect with yourself again, just whatever age you are at, pretend like you're starting from zero and say, okay, I am going to play detective. I want to find out all the parts about Gina. You know, I, I I blogged recently about taking myself out on a date and how that has become a, a practice for myself. Because I'm, I'm really, what, why do we go out on a date? We go out on a date because we wanna enjoy our time and find out more about the other person and share. And can I do that with myself? And so I spent a lot of intentional time discovering me. Like, I don't freaking like roses. I, I discovered <laughs> that I love hydrangeas. Like I went to a flower shop and I said, I'm gonna spend some time in this flower. And I wanna get curious about 
and I just literally walked around and I found out that I absolutely love hydrangeas. I love how they look. I, I, they're all these little flowers. And I just, it was like a new, I'm like, huh, I don't ever want roses again. Like nobody, (laughs) I want hydrangeas, like something as simple as that, you know, like, what do I really love? What music can I get curious? Could I experiment with, with different, you know, with art, with, so I, that for me is the first step, start to become a detective and, it's like falling in love with yourself again. It sounds so cliche, but it's like, what do I need to know about myself? I've made all these assumptions about who Gina is, but w- what else can I find out about her? I uh, call it finding your yes and your no, like, like really mm. figuring out is it, you know, do I want chocolate ice cream? <laughs> yes or no? Like yes. even practicing I mean, something I, like that. I cook dinner based on what I think my kids will eat. I mean, I rarely say, what does Gina <laughs> yeah. And and then even if like even on the days I'm by myself, I'm like, oh, what should I should I be eating? Like, yes, what the hell? I know, you know like, right? So it's not even like what I actually. So could I <laughs> indulge myself in in really being curious about what I actually want? You know, I think there's a statistic. Dr. Joe Dispenza, whom I absolutely love, he said by thirty by about the age of thirty five, we ninety five percent of our life is run by habit. Ninety five percent, like we just habitually do the same things, think the same thoughts, do the same. So could I start to unravel that and unpack that and start to question everything, like start to question who I actually am. You know, I have this personality, I call it Gina, but it's just based on how I've always acted and responded based on, on limiting beliefs, based on just a whole lifetime of, of, of habit. So could I start to get curious and say, huh, if, if I, if I had like amnesia, today and I don't remember anything about the Gina of yesterday. Oh, or I love that. that. That's a great way yeah. of looking at it. Right? Like what, what food would I like? Like I I've always said, you know, I'm carb addicted, but I'm, I'm in, it's so interesting now that I'm craving different, th- like I, I don't know. I'm just open to anything. I'm open to, I have these stories that that I tell myself, like, I love carbs. I hate to exercise. (laughs) I, you know, I love Latin music. And now I'm starting to question everything. I'm like, "Hmm, what other music might I like? Or what other ways of moving my body might I like? Or what other, you know, so it's just, it's questioning everything, making no assumptions and questioning everything. It it, Was there a gift in the experience of being to being told you were too much. Oh, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Well, uh, the, the gift was um, coming to a point where um, it was so painful, uh, so uncomfortable to dim that it forced me to, to, to be curious about another way. Um, had I not been told I was too much, I may have, at least to the degree that I was, I may have just ridden very comfortably in that boat of my comfort zone. I would have just, just, it would have been just comfortable enough to sail on that boat forever. And what's happened Um, as a result of, of not staying comfortable? My whole life has changed. It's, it's barely recognizable. Um, it, it really is barely recognizable. And, um, more than anything, I know it's it's very exciting to look at, you know, the success. That's why sometimes I cringe with the opening intro, like, she's doing this, she's doing that. <laughs> um, the, the truth is, like, I still have to put my head down on my pillow at night, and I, it's me, myself, and I, right? Like, it's it's still Gina. So there's not people, like, telling me they love me, and there's not all this success. When I lay down my head on my pillow at night, it's still me with me, and more than anything, what this experience has, has gifted me with was, is um, really, I, I'm feeling very emotional just saying this, but just actually like a, appreciating um, my courage and seeing how, how much I can honor myself and I'm being so proud of me. Like I've had so many great accomplishments in my life, but nothing can compare to me being able to put my head on the pillow and say, I today lived as much as Gina as I, as I have ever before. And if that's not the greatest accomplishment of my life, more than my kids, more than viral videos, more than anything else I could do that at the end of my life is the most important thing that I 
I, I guess I did it my way. Thank you, Frankie. <laughs> so not but I, but I lived my, my true person. I showed up fully as me. That's, that's, that's the, the best gift. I think that's what we're here to do. I honestly, I honestly believe that that is solely the only thing we're supposed to do is to yeah. show up and live as fully and completely through this experience as we can. And mm. coming inward, like you were talking about is, is the trip of how to do that. I, yes. I, I just, I can't thank you enough for spending this time with me. And I, I think what I'm really taking away is that, you know, anyone that's looking to embrace what, what they're here to live may require them to walk through some old thinking, but for you, it was to research, to do some reading, maybe read about people who had done it or, or what it's all about. I heard uh, to also allow the emotion that maybe has been pushed down to come up and just feel it and allow it to come up and out. And then I think the third really was about getting curious, as uh, you like to say, mm -hmm. and and just considering a baby step, uh, tuning into maybe the thoughts that are are giving you some inklings as to what to do next. And just, and I, I, I have it. to, I have to add one okay, more, um, yeah. only because, only because I could, none of this could have been possible without calling in a supporting cast. We cannot. I am such an ind fiercely independent woman, and I'm, I've always been very proud of that, and I am, have been so humbled and so grateful um, to have, and it's not a ton of people. It's like two, maybe three people that I can, I can count on because this journey is going to, um, bring you face to face with, you know, that some of the, some of the darkest demons, right. But it's so when you have one, two people that you can trust that will hold you in the space of reminding you of who you are, knowing that you are loved regardless, it's so important. Do not go there alone, whether it's a hiring a coach um, a therapist, uh, your best friend, you know, find a person who will honor you on this path. It's so, 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 so crucial. And you know, when you say that, I think some people are still going to think, you know, I don't have anyone, no one's going to support me on doing something like that or whatever. And, you know, yeah. I had a space like that. And what I did is I, you talked about doing research, but nowadays you can have podcasts. You can, you can be listening to people who support that journey and they may not be in your living room, but but they're there and you can tune into that until you start to build that um, safe circle. Would you agree or? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, oh my gosh, there's, there's so many, I mean, there's so many communities. Ask Lori, ask me, find us online. There is just, everybody wants this. Just no one's talking yeah, about yeah. it. So I know it's there, right? It's available. We just have to be willing to, um, to, to ask when, you know, we're talking about, or a lot of people are talking about, oh, you just got to love yourself wholly and completely, or you just need to love yourself. <laughs> and, and I know that that's really what we're talking about here, but yeah. do you have a way of kind of summarizing what loving yourself means for you? Oh, it's changed so much for me. Um, you know, I would spew self-love like unicorns farting rainbows <laughs> for years. Like, you know, it was like this beautiful thing about, you know, taking care of yourself and doing, you know, what you love. And um, what I realize now is that true self-love, just like it is in relationship with someone else, true self-love is honesty. True self-love is, is allowing Gina to be honest with myself first and then with others about what I'm really feeling like allowing me to feel and be and express my too muchness. Um, that is true self-love. It's not just about saying, oh, I love all these parts of you, or I love you uh, because you're trying to grow, or I love you because you're getting better. Like true self-love for me is allowing myself to get really ugly and snotty and rant. True self-love is when I drop the ball, which I do all the time still, and 
saying, okay, you dropped the ball. Okay. It's not, the, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. True self-love is being willing to get messy. Mm. Um, it's not just about self-care and, and manicures and, um, you know, taking a dance class. It is, it is full, full on honesty. That's true self-love for me. So, so beautiful as always. I so enjoyed our conversation today and I just want to honor and appreciate all the work that you're doing. I know that there are a lot of people that just are so excited about somebody verbalizing what they're feeling. And you, I just have to say to anyone that's listening, your Facebook posts, your writings and your book, Gina has a, a, the most brilliant way of zeroing in on the whole experience <laughs> and the thoughts, the emotions, the, the reactions, the, the desire to respond one way, but, and, and you just really do have a gift of, of sharing that in the written word so that it's like, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. And, Aww. and so if anyone is interested, I, what your Facebook, um, do you know your Facebook address? Would you like to share? Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for those beautiful words, Lori. I, I appreciate it. Um, it's, it's Gina Hatz's Too Much Woman. I think if you um, look up either of those, you'll find Okay. Me. And you yeah. have a, a group also that, you know, Gina interacts with the group on a regular basis. And uh, so if, if you are at all interested in anything that Gina shared today, I, I would completely, you know, encourage you to um, join Gina in, a, in the group you know, look for a too much woman event. Now I do think you have a couple coming up, right? I do have a couple coming up. Um, uh, um, everything's posted on my website, ginahatsis.com, but I, I do want to just please allow me the opportunity to thank you, Lori, for um, always giving me um, incredible platforms to share. Um, thank you for doing the work that you do because it allows all of us to speak our truth. So I, I am very grateful for you in my life. I just needed to to say thank that you. publicly. Very sweet. All right. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to connecting again in the future. You've been listening to Lori Brandt, the happiness coach. If you enjoyed the program, please go to iTunes and follow, rate, or leave a comment. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, life coach certification, go to my website, lauriebrandt.com, or perhaps even attending our Unleash Your Greatness conference so greatness can reflect back in beautiful Ridgeway, Ontario at the Buffalo Canoe Club on the shores of Lake Erie. You can learn more at www.unleashmygreatness.com.